Welcome to the April 2022 Utah Amateur Radio Club Virtual Online Meeting. Uh, Morris, uh, say hello, Morris. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the York meeting online again. We really, really, really believe that starting with the September meeting, we will be in person and we hope and well, we believe that we will also be online. Uh, if we're not online, we will record what we do on the meeting and then put it up on YouTube. So that will be starting in September. Um, uh, our, our speaker tonight is, is familiar to most of you that have ever been to Ray Elko. Uh, once that, uh, the smoke got let out of that uh, piece of equipment, uh, he decided, oh, well, I've got all this money. I'll just go buy another company. So I'll let him tell you about that. Uh, but uh, I want to mention that we have two classes starting next week, a technician class and a general class. The technician class will run on Monday evenings from 7 to 9 p.m. on Zoom, and the general class will run at the same time except on Wednesdays. And it will run for about nine weeks, which will put it into June, unfortunately. I, I always hope to end before June, but looks like we're going to have a problem with that this year. Anyway, um, it's going to be an exciting next couple of months. We've got things going offline and things going online. And um, if you haven't tried out our remote sites, I strongly encourage you to do that if you have a general or higher class license. Uh, they're both uh, excellent sites, very low noise, and uh, the one at Lemington is an outstanding antenna, uh, log periodic. Glenn's, Glenn's internet is still down up there, so... Uh, it probably won't be till it melts and that the, the company can drive up there themselves before they fix the stupid thing. So it's their equipment that's failed. Oh, okay. All right. So uh, I think that's all I have to say. Oh, if you're interested in the class or you know somebody that's interested in getting their ham license, please send them my email address and have them contact me via email. It's really the only thing that works. Uh, if we get a phone number that we don't recognize, we don't answer it. And then we forget to listen to our messages. So you would likely be disappointed. So send me an email and you can send it to me at my call sign, AD7SR, that's Alpha Delta 7 Sierra Romeo at ARRL.net. Back to Clint. All right. And if you do take an exam, either with Morris or someone else, go to ham, hamstudy.org slash sessions hamstudy.org slash sessions, where you can find a listing for online and in-person exam sessions. Uh, there's quite a few in-person exam sessions going on in even in the Utah area, Salt Lake metro area. And there are online ones you can take that are, who knows where they are, they're in this country somewhere, but you can do those too. Also, let me just interrupt you for a second. That hamsteady.org website is also an excellent place to go for practice exams. Right. Yeah. I've never been there, but I'll take your word for it. <laughs> You're the expert. The other thing I should remind people of and keep it on their calendar is field day is coming up in May. And let's say that is occurring on the 25th, the weekend of the 25th. So 
our plan is to have it at Payson Lakes as we've had it before. Payson Lakes is up above Payson. What a surprise. At about 80 to 8,500 feet. So be sure to bring your warm jacket if you're going to go up there. But we encourage you to come up even for the day. But we also encourage you to camp overnight. No, you brought, you got that trailer during the pandemic. So use it. Enjoy it up there. We will have two beam antennas on towers. And if you have n never done anything like that, or done any sort of portable operation like that, that's even a better reason for you to go up there and do it because you will have a lot of fun. You will learn a whole lot at once. And that's probably why you got your ham license is to be able to do stuff like that. This isn't going to be an emergency, we hope, but it, it exercises many of the skills that you would need to acquire if it were an emergency like coming up with power, remembering how to use your radio that after you dust it off and setting up an antenna. And also, if you don't know, you can be around people who can pretend they do know. Let's see here. Um, now, Mike, uh, KI7MTI, what do we what do you have in store for us for the next meeting or two? Well, the uh, next meeting is going to be in May. I don't think you want to uh, have the um, um, field days in May because um, uh, you'll be the only one up there at Payson Lake. It's in June. But um, in May, um, NOGI, um, KN0JI will be um, doing both the Elmer's Corner and the main uh, program. For Elmer's Corner, uh, he's going to be talking about duplexers. He's going to tell us what they are and how they work. Uh, for Elmer's Corner, He's going to uh, tell us about SWRs and how they could kill you if you're not careful. So that uh, is what's coming up um, uh, in the near future. Okay, I7MTI, back to the moderator. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Let's see. Uh, I will address this briefly. Some of you have heard that Gordon isn't doing too well. That is not a rumor. He's hanging in there, and we wish him the best. Um, but you... But he, at the present time, he is wishing to hand over his editorial duties and the, his duties for the Sunday Night Net. We hope that he can uh, get back to doing it, and maybe he will. But we, you're, well, you're encouraged to send him emails or send him a card. You can find his uh, address in the microvolt. You know, an old-fashioned card. He's an old-fashioned kind of guy, so he would appreciate a card. Um, but anyway. So we wish him the best. And I think that is about it for the time being. Uh, Morris, I'm going to wake you up again. Can you think of anything else that uh, we need to talk about before we throw it to Mike and company? Uh, nothing jumps to mind. Um, no. Oh, okay. That was concise. Well, yeah. Oh. Mention we got we ought to mention the fact that we do not have a meeting in July and August, but in July we do have a steak fry. Right. And uh, if Chuck is on there, he can probably tell us the exact date of the steak fry. Yeah, it's going to be. A, uh, let's see. We're vamping here. It's uh, July sixteenth. July one six. Okay. Keep that date. Mark that date. July sixteenth at the spruces in big cottonwood canyon if you've ever been there in the past 20 or so years it's the same place nice and cool up there with the babbling brook and uh and all that so well at least to hope the book's babbling you never know what's going to happen in a drought do you all right i think that takes care of our business mike introduce your guest and we'll see and we'll take it from there and by the way before i do that uh i need to acknowledge a few people that are on the youtubes um i can oops i dropped my youtube connect i dropped my youtube connection um oh wait here we go we have uh john brewer and his, and susan his much better half saying hello uh jonathan morrison uh is in there uh, appreciate you come you being here and dick true w7sae now 70 years continuously licensed same call um and dave sauce uh he mentions 
that when there was a Lafayette store before there was a Rayalco store. That was a bit before my time, but I do remember when the Lafayette sign was still up. Oh, and he also remembers when Allied was on Fifth South. That is before my time. Anyway, I thought I'd acknowledge those people in the gallery. With that, I will throw it to you for real this time, Mike. Can I just have an MTI? Take it away. Hey, well, we're starting out the um, meeting with Elmer's Corner, and I'm presenting that uh, tonight. So I'm going to um, uh, go into um, uh, hiding my view here and sharing my view over here. And um, uh, hey, so, sorry, Mike, Chuck, Chuck says something. Break in briefly. OK, I, I, I should have mentioned when I talked about Gordon, we are looking for a replacement editor. It's an elected board position, although we have provisions in mid season. So if you if you have a decent way with words and all that and are interested in being the mark of old editor, uh, we are interested in hearing from you. Contact any of the board members. Um, any of them will work and we'll see what we see what see what you have for us. Uh, sorry, Mike. Uh, I figured that was important enough to interrupt you, but hopefully you've gotten set up already. Uh, yes, I'm ready to go. You can hear me okay? You're doing great. Thanks. All right. I'm going to go ahead and share. And we'll get... Um... Okay. Um... I'm dedicating tonight's Elmer's Corner presentation to Gordon Smith, K7HFE, a friend and Elmer to hams in the UR community. Ask any group of hams to list their favorite nets and you're likely to find no two have the same list. For various reasons, we choose the nets that we like based on our personalities. For example, I'm a member of the Utah VHF Society, but I don't participate in the club's net on Tuesday at 8 p.m because that's the time for the Sinbad Desert Amateur Radio Club net, and that's one of my favorite nets. The purpose of this program is to give new hams an overview of the different types of nets available along the Wasatch Front and throughout Utah. I will also talk briefly about HF nets that have a larger geographical reach than nets held over VHF and UHF. The last four slides of this presentation list URLs and information on 10 and 6 meter nets that you can copy with your smartphone's camera or computer's print screen function. An amateur radio net or simply ham net is an on the air gathering of amateur radio operators. Most nets convene on a regular schedule and specific frequency. Nets are generally organized for a particular purpose such as relaying messages, discussing a common topic of interest or simply as a regular gathering of friends for conversation. A formal or directed net has a single net control station that manages its operations for a given session. Generally, the net control operator calls the net to order at its designated start time, does a roll call, may ask hams to weigh in on a topic, keeps track of the roster of stations for that particular net session and generally orchestrates the operation of the net. Most amateur radio clubs in Utah host weekly nets. Tuning into one or more of these nets can help you learn a lot about the hobby and how to get the most out of it. You'll also make new friends in the local ham community. Many nets meet regularly in order to develop on the air skills preparation for emergency communications in the communities that are served by the club hosting the net. These nets generally present a training topic before or after roll call. Some nets hold more than one net each week. The Utah Valley Amateur Radio Club may hold the record in Utah for the number of nets that it sponsors. Let's move on to information nets. Information nets are used to transmit official bulletins, provide information on topics of interest to hams, and to answer general questions on amateur radio related topics. Each Sunday at 2100 hours or 9 p.m. local time, the Utah Amateur Radio Club holds an information net. The net starts out with the net control operator reading the preamble, which is standard for most nets. The preamble lists the purpose of the net, information on UARC, including our repeaters, the date, time, and topics for the upcoming meeting, and other club information. 
like the majority of nets here in Utah and elsewhere, the UARC information net is a directed net, meaning that all comments should be addressed to the net control operator. Besides the um, amateur radio news line, AWRL bulletin, and testing information, this net has a segment for other club information. We strongly encourage other clubs to take this opportunity to discuss their upcoming projects, meetings, activities, or accomplishments. Is your club having a special activity such as a fox hunt or Santa's net? Are you looking for hams to provide communications for a public event such as a marathon or parade? Here's a forum for getting the word out. Lastly, the round table gives everyone a chance to comment, question, or weigh in on a topic and bring it up for discussion. The only dumb question is the one that doesn't get asked. So get over your mic fright and ask that question. Oh, and don't worry about getting laughed at behind your back. We all sound foolish on air from time to time. If you can't laugh at your own gaps, you'll be an unhappy ham. Since this is a directed net, you should start out with your call sign and first name and then wait for the moderator to recognize you. The Utah VHF Society holds its weekly swap and traffic net on Tuesday at 8 p.m. This net is held over the inter uh, mountain intertie repeater system. Locally, you can access the intertie via the repeater on Farnsworth Peak. The frequency is 147.120 megahertz with a positive offset and PL tone of 100 hertz. Nets may also be set up during special events or emergencies such as severe weather events, for example, during a Skywarn activation. Skywarn is a program of the National Weather Service. Its mission is to collect reports of localized severe weather in the United States. Skywarn spotters with amateur radio licenses communicate with one another during severe storm events via amateur radio nets since severe weather can significantly disrupt local telecommunication systems. You may have heard a ham make an on-air reference to an ARIES net. ARIES stands for Amateur Radio Emergency Service. ARIES groups are composed of volunteer amateur radio operators who join together to provide emergency and or auxiliary communication services for public safety and public service organizations. Every licensed amateur, regardless of membership in the AWRL or any local or national orga organization, is eligible to apply for membership in ARIES. Training may ne be needed to fully participate in ARIES. Because ARIES is an amateur radio program, only licensed radio amateurs are eligible for membership. Generally, ARIES groups are autonomous and operate locally, usually at the county level. Most ARIES groups hold regular nets for the purpose of practicing radio communication so proper radio procedures can be followed in the event of an actual emergency. The possession of emergency powered equipment is desirable, but not a requirement. An informal net may have a net control station, but lacks some or all of the formalities and protocols other than those used in non-net on the air operation or it could begin at the designated time and frequency in an ad hoc fashion by whoever arrives first. That's dedicated to certain topics such as discussing antique ham radio equipment or um, may use a net control station simply to control the order in which participants transmit their comments to the group in a round table style. There are several informal nets throughout the state such as the 76ers in Utah County or the Geezers Net in Southeastern Utah. However, the K7XRD social net is the one I'm most familiar with. Sponsored by the Salt Lake Crossroads Amateur Radio Club, this net is held Monday through Friday at 1900 hours or 7 p.m. There is a net control station for this net, but no formal roll call. Ham simply check in when asked to by the net control operator. Frequently, chaos ensues as several hams try to check in at the same time, but the NCO does a good job of getting things sorted out. Then each member of the group is asked about their day and suggestions for that night's topic. 
Ham radio topics may be discussed, but the group often decides to discuss some topic not directly related to amateur radio. Do you want to learn Morse code? There's a net for that. The Texas Slow Net is well suited for operators who are interested in building proficiency in the international Morse code while learning about handling procedures in CW traffic nets. During each session, a traffic handling lesson in the form of a radiogram is sent to all participants. This net meets daily at 7.45 p.m. local time on 3570 kilohertz, more or less, depending on QRM. Now that the sun cycle is showing promise for vastly improved propagation, it's time to get that HF rig out of storage and get, it on, and get in on the action. If you are a technician, you may think that there is nothing that you can do to take part in the celebrations. Well, don't be so glum. The reports are coming in daily of faraway stations being heard on 10 meters. Surely six meters can't be hard, far behind. As Paul Plack, AE4, KR pointed out in last month's Elmer's Corner, there's a lot of real estate that techs can explore in the portions of the 10 meter band open to them. If you miss that program, it's worth checking out. One way to take advantage of the excitement of HF is to get a 10 meter all mode mobile radio. I looked on eBay and saw some for sale for around $250. Build a horizontal dipole, or purchase a 10 meter vertical stick and mag mount and you're in business. Of course, you'll want to get some practice using your new toy. Well, there are several nets that uh, can get you started on your HF adventure. AE4KR hosts one each Wednesday at 8 p.m. on 28.345 megahertz upper sideband. Utah Valley Amateur Radio Club also hosts a 10 meter net in rotation with a 40 and 80 meter net on Wednesday at 9 p.m. on the same frequency. Finally, the Ogden Amateur Radio Club has a 10 meter net each Thursday at 7 p.m. on 28.385 megahertz upper sideband. There are a couple of six meter nets that you may wish to join too. Utah Valley Amateur Radio Club hosts one at 50.140 megahertz upper sideband each Friday at 8 p.m. followed closely by Morris Farmer 87SR's six pack net at 50.150 megahertz USB at 9 p.m. The use of digital technology to send and receive radio signals across the airwaves is becoming ever more popular here at home and around the world. So it follows that there would be thousands of digital nets in the US and around the world to choose from. DSTAR, DMR, C4FM, are the UHF and VHF digital modes that you may want to explore with your digital HT over a digitally enabled repeater and you can access Echolink from your smartphone. All right, get ready because here come the slides um, with links for you to copy. That's slide number one. This slide number two. Slide number three. And here's one on information on uh, 10 and 6 meter nets. And that concludes this month's Elmer's Corner segment of the meeting. This is KI7 MTI turning the meeting back over to the moderator, 73. Oh, <laughs> So I'll let you introduce him, Mike. All right. He, um, even though he needs no introduction. No, no, everybody should know him. Um, uh, uh, Robert Gunnell is the uh, owner and um, uh, president of Standard Supply Electronics here in Salt Lake City. Um, and um, uh, uh, Robert's uh, call sign is KI7FUJ. Uh, so uh, he is a member of the ham community. Um, he is a very knowledgeable person. I have learned a lot from uh, watching this um, uh, video. Um, a lot of things I had no idea um, about. So I'll leave that um, uh, up to, um, I'll turn it over to um, Clint here to do the video, KI7MTI. 
Well, let's see. Just before you do that, have just Robert say a few words. Uh, you know. Oh, just... yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Robert. Okay. Hi, everybody. Am I on screen? Yes, you are. Okay. So I'd just like to say hi to everyone. And uh, there's a few things I forgot to mention in the video. And the first thing is soldering irons and solder guns get very, very hot. And sometimes you cannot tell if they are hot by looking at them. Uh, they're usually around 600 to 1300 degrees. So be very careful. You can't tell the difference between um, a hot soldering iron and a cold one by just looking at it a lot of times. So um, anyway, my name's Robert Gunnell. As as I was introduced, and uh, I used to be the owner at Ray Elko Electronics, and unfortunately we caught on fire back in 2018. And my wife and I bought into the business of Standard Supply Electronics, and we are currently running that. And uh, it's not exactly the same as Ray Elko, but it's probably the closest thing you'll find to a Ray Elko this side of the Mississippi. So anyway, um, I'm glad to be able to try and help everyone with uh, soldering techniques. I know my techniques aren't perfect, but you know we try, and we just and you get better as you do it. So everyone, just keep that in mind. All right, thanks. Uh, turn it back over to Mike for the video. I think uh, Clint's going to do the video oh, yeah, I'm for sorry. us. I'm sorry. All right. So are we ready, Mr. Music? I think we are. Okay. Let's see if this works. So we would like to go over some of the soldering irons and solder guns uh, real quick and show you kind of what's available in the marketplace and about how much they run. We'll also talk a little bit about the uh, amount of power that they can do and what the typical job would be for a, a gun or an iron or a station. So this is a, uh, this is a very low wattage iron. This is a 12 watt. Now something like this would be used for very small soldering, like on surface mount items on a board could be used for small wires this one runs about fifty five dollars this is an inexpensive 30 watt iron and this one is uh one that we sell a lot of and it does a fair job it's got a a fairly pointed tip it's 30 watts runs about thirteen dollars um, this is a kind of a professional iron from Weller. This is 25 watts. Great for soldering small wires and also circuit board work. We also sell a lot of different tips that fit this unit. This is the tip that comes with it. That one runs about $60. And this is a 35 watt of the same uh, family. Um, basically the same thing. It uses the same tips. If you had both of them, the tips would be interchangeable. It's also These are both also grounded for um, working on things that are static sensitive. This is a 45 watt desoldering tool. Notice how it has the bulb attached to it permanently. And if you look at it, you can see it's got a little hole in the tip. And that's a 45 watt iron attached to a bulb, so you can go through and desolder things rather fast. That unit runs about $27. Now we're moving on to the solder gun. This is a gun. Now, notice how it says 140 watt and 100 watt. And then it has different temperature, 900 or 485. That means that it's a dual temperature gun 
and 140 watts is quite a bit. As you notice, the other wattages on the irons were much smaller. This could be used for heavy wire, uh, copper boards that are very thick copper, so they dissipate a lot of heat. Sometimes you've got to have a gun with the power to do uh, soldering because the copper can dissipate so much heat sometimes. That runs about $51 currently. This is a 60 watt professional iron from Weller. And this one is really nice because this one, uh, whatever tip you put inside the heating element regulates that iron at that temperature. And this is one that I will be demonstrating. That's one that I really like to use. It's almost like using a solder station. That one currently is $117. This is a solder station that we sell the heck out of. It's adjustable heat from 5 to 40 watts up to 900 degrees. This one runs about $71. It's nice because it's got an on-off switch that lights up. It's got the knob that you can turn the temperature up and down. It's got a solder stand and a place to put a sponge. The tip that comes with it is the ST3 to begin with. The other tips are available for about $5 to $6. Now this is a nicer station. It shows the temperature um, on the screen on the front adjustable heat, up-down buttons. It also comes with a solder stand that holds a sponge. That's very convenient. That's the tip that comes with the unit to begin with. Again, we do have other tips available for these stations. And that one's made by Weller, a quality unit. $142.71 is the current price. Um, this is a higher-end station made by a company called Metcal. This one is used for soldering and rework system. Reworking is uh, involved with very small components, a lot of times surface mount. The temperature is very well regulated with this unit, and it instantly heats up. Um, it's a very good station for a bench where there's a lot of soldering going on for small items. This unit runs currently $579. And Metcal is one of the top of the line solder stations. Alright, next we're going to talk about the different types of solder and different types of uh, chemicals that are used with soldering. As you can see, these are both made by a company called Kester. And this is about the biggest solder that you'd want to use with electronics. This has a rosin core, so the core has already got a flux in it. It just melts right together. This is a .05 diameter solder. And then the next one is a little bit smaller. In diameter this is a 0 0.031 this is a very popular solder it's one of the ones that I'll be demonstrating and this is basically the same thing a different brand and this is a pocket tube also 0 0.031 diameter with a flux core rosin is what makes the solder stick it's basically a tree sap this is a flux dispensing pen. Now, you just basically draw the flux on like a Sharpie. It's rosin, activated flux. It says no clean. That just means it's a low residue. So you probably won't have to use a flux remover afterwards. A pen like that runs about $5 currently. The solder tube itself is about four and a half bucks. This is a very excellent solder from Kester. This is a 6337 mix, 
0 .031. A pound of that runs about $35. It's also a no clean, so it's a lower residue solder than most, but still has enough in there to do the job excellent. This is a solder paste. Now you wonder, well, there's different types of paste. And this one is a paste with very, very fine particles of solder mixed into the paste. It usually comes in a syringe and is used for surface mount rework. So you can apply that to the board or the part and it will uh, kind of act like a gooey substance that holds the part in place while you heat it with some kind of hot air. And then the hot air will melt the solder and hold the part in place permanently. Um, this is tinning solution. It's a little can, like a little tobacco can almost. And this is, uh, is great for tinning your tip to make better solder joints. As you're soldering, you'll dip your tip into the tinning solution. That currently runs about $14. This is a solder that is water soluble. Um, the, the center core flux is organic. And this solder is a little more expensive as you can see, about $66 for a one pound spool. Also made by Kester. 0 .031 again is a very common size for electronic soldering. This solder, water soluble, after you're done soldering your board, you can rinse the board with water and it removes the excess residue of flux on the board. It's great. Um, it saves you money in the long run because you can just wash off your board with, with water instead of buying a, a flux remover. Moving on, this is a solder paste. Uh, solder paste is a little bit different than flux, liquid flux, because it's more of a solid material, like a butter almost. It's rosin activated, great for electronics. I use mine to dip my solder tip into. It's a little bit cheaper than the tinning solution. As you can see, a can of this runs about $8.33 currently, and it's great for dipping wires into it and then soldering them. Um, we have the liquid flux. This is a 100 milliliter bottle, runs about $11. And this is a larger bottle of liquid flux. Um, a bottle like that runs about $35 now. Um, as you can see, it, it's basically tree sap. That's what rosin is. It's what makes solder stick. If you didn't have the rosin, the solder would just ball up and roll away. This is a flux remover spray from Tech Spray. This is a 10 ounce can, comes with a little straw, you put it in the nozzle, and you can blow the flux off of the board, or if you reworked something, you can remove the flux from the board with this. It's great for removing uh, rosin core flux residue. A little cheaper solution for that would be just a pure isopropyl alcohol. This is not the drugstore alcohol. Drugstore alcohol has a big water base to it. it can corrode parts. This is 99.9% .9 pure isopropyl. Runs about $11 a bottle currently comes in a pump spray. Um, the reason we use the pump is because it keeps the water out of the alcohol. Anytime that you remove the lid from an alcohol container that's this pure, the air will get into it, into the bottle, and the air itself has liquid, it has water in it, and it will dilute the alcohol over time. If you use a pump, that doesn't happen. Next, we're going to go over how to put on a PL259. This is a 
an RG Mini 8 coax. This is a 50 ohm coax commonly used in the ham radio or CB radio industry. This is a uh, this is the wire that has been stripped. This has a clear jacket. You can't really see it, but there is a clear jacket on this coax. It looks kind of neat because it's got that copper look to it. And it's got the center conductor that I've already tinned. And this is stripped and, and the braid is folded back. See how I can fold that braid back? It's got a lot of braid on it. It's a nice coax. This is U.S. made stuff. Um, and you pull that back. What I'm making here is a short um, mel to mel cable. So I'm going to put the insert for the uh, PL259. This is designed for the Mini 8 and it's got threads. And you put that on the one side of the coax like so and then the PL259 itself it comes apart typically this is the way you you purchase it is like this and this thing kind of slides back and forth there's the solder hole and the threads on the back and this this connector was developed uh, during the Second World War, I've heard, and uh, it was designed to be a filled connector. Now, soldering makes it permanent, but originally it was designed to be a, a connector that worked in the field. What you want is that center conductor just to barely come up with no braid touching it at all not even one strand you want to put that through the middle and so that that's just barely showing and then you take the back piece and you thread that into the uh, the connector and we wanna we wanna screw this piece back off again And then we've got these little grips that you put your fingers on. Now, there's a myth that this is meant, meant to be soldered also. Not true, because you'll melt that center plastic. If you stay on that too long with the soldering iron, you'll melt that Delrin in the middle. And it, you'll have a gooey mess. I've seen lots of people do it. Those holes are for for see-through so you can see that the braid is in there and you and now you're twisting it just hold it with your fingers and you might want to use some pliers at the final touches on the insert and then continue to thread until it's tight and you can see the copper through the holes and the center conductor coming through and we'll solder that in just a moment and then you'll put this piece back on threads back on there and you've got your connector and we're going to hit it with the 60 watt iron We'll put that in the helping hand. Again, I'm going to use the painter's tape to hold down my helping hand. Holds it on the bench nicely. And I'm going to want to slant that down just slightly so that gravity will keep the solder going down. And I'm going to heat this tip. And I'm going to also touch the center of the pin and touch them both at the same time, thus making a good shiny solder joint.
and that that should be sufficient we don't want to have too much solder on the outside of the pin we'll let that cool down now the smoke you're seeing come off the tip is actually the flux the flux again is what makes the solder stick and put the soldering iron back it should be cooled down by now and we've got a completed joint now this is what threads on to the radio holds it in place now we want to test this to make sure that we don't have a short we're going to use a multimeter and we're going to set it to the sound setting here it has the little sound audible it's also the diode check and we're going to touch the leads together the red and black leads and we hear that tone now for testing we are going to go from the outer shell to the center and we don't hear any kind of a beep which is a good thing that means we don't have a short so that's a good thing now we're going to go to the other end of the coax I'm just going to jab it into the braid and I'm going to touch the shell good we've got contact and we don't have a short now I'm going to carefully hold that in the center and touch the shell we don't have a short that's good and we do have conductivity on the center conductor and that's what we want so we know we've got a good connection now I probably want to clean this up with some alcohol because there's some rosin residue on there and then I'll have a good contact next we're going to talk about this thing I've got on my hat it's a it's an LED clip-on light I can do one LED three five or an emergency I can do flashing that's what you've been seeing uh, I sometimes use this for soldering and other things around my business um, we're gonna talk about desoldering I'm uh, currently rebuilding a uh, voltage regulator circuit and I've got to do some resoldering on this thing and I'm gonna show you how to remove solder off of a proto board you can see that the the copper eyelet holes are on this side and the items are pushed through the holes and then they're soldered and made traces on the other side so we've got to rebuild this and I've got to do some unsoldering so I'll take the wick and with my 60 watt Weller iron I'm going to press the wick down on the solder joint and you'll see that the solder absorbs into the wick as I go and this is great for um, reworking boards and removing components and changing them out if you've got to see how that absorbs into the wick makes it much easier to remove the parts um, here's the other item that we currently use is a, a solder sucker and you press this uh, lever down with your thumb and then you hit the button and it sucks the solder while it's liquefied up into the chamber now I'm going to use some painters tape to hold this board in place while I get a little more aggressive I use the painters tape because it can be removed without leaving a big residue later it's easy to pull off and we're gonna solder or we're gonna desolder this board up really good see how it sucked out right up in there and we're gonna 
continue on desoldering this whole thing because I've got to really rework this board and remove some of these components. And once you get the solder removed to a certain point, it will be a lot easier to pull the items out. <clears throat> like this resistor right here. I can now heat that up and get it right out of the board. See that came out of there. Um, that's one of the items that I needed to remove. And then I can lift this uh, this lead off. This was a jumper put on. This isn't a very well built prototype. But this is just a really good example to see how the desoldering is, is done. And of course after you desolder stuff you do have to cut that section off with some scissors or something and, and then you just start over and you keep pulling it out of the reel and discard it. Alright for this next segment we are going to change a DC plug on a power supply. How many times have you bought a power supply and it's the wrong plug on the end? You know these connectors that have the hole in the middle. There's so many different sizes these days. We're going to show you a very effective way to solder these on and not have a mess. But first we need to figure out, okay this is a this is a DC power supply and this one, in this case, somebody's already cut the wire. Somebody's already cut the other plug off. So, I need to determine which one's positive and negative. So I don't blow up my device. So I'm going to put the meter on. I'm going to put the meter on DC volts. And that's the solid line with the dot, dot, dot below it. And I'm going to then plug the unit in. And when I put the leads on, the positive and negative lead, this is actually measuring about 29 volts. That's all right. But see how it has that negative symbol light up in front of the 29. Hope you can see that. There's a little bit of glare. A little negative symbol light up before the 29. And that means I've got my red and black backwards. So I'm going to flip those around and then I'm going to measure it and the negative symbol before the 29 goes away. And that means I've got the polarity right, so the positive wire in this case is the one that doesn't have the writing on the wire. One wire has writing on it and the other one doesn't. So I'm going to, this is, this is a really good tip, I hope you guys, if you don't learn anything else from me today, it's this one. I've unplugged the unit from the wall so I don't short it out when I cut it. And I'm going to cut the negative lead a little bit shorter than the positive. And the reason I do that is because I don't want it to short out inside the small connector. And then I'm going to put the wires through the back shell and the threads have to be closest to the to the wire because you're going to have to thread it on. And now, here's another tip, the painter's tape again. I'm going to hold that in place just using painter's tape. It's very effective. 
Going to get the 60 watt weller out. Going to tin my tip. Wipe that clean on the sponge. I got a nice shiny tip now. The key to a good solder joint is always have a shiny joint and a shiny tip. We're adding solder. Now, we're going to tin the two wires with solder. And tinning really helps quite a bit because when you've got a tinned wire, it solders so much easier and faster. If we stayed on this connector too long, we would melt it. And now, I'm going to make sure you guys can see this. I'm going to tin the contacts of the connector now. And we've got a positive and a negative. Now, we'll get the meter out of the way. We don't need it right now. Just the wires. And always solder the negative wire first so you can lay it down in that groove okay let it cool down and then you're gonna do this the same thing with the positive, I'm going to cut that a little bit shorter. I'm going to put the positive on next. And just put it right underneath the terminal. Remember, I've already got them tinned. These connectors don't have a lot of room to work with. But because I've already got the two of them tinned, I'm just tacking them together. Let it cool down, and there's our solder joints. And it's not likely that the positive and negative will touch in there now. Now that negative has got a ball. I'm going to melt that, flatten it out a little, and you can see now that that's a pretty good solder joint. Now I'm going to put the I'm going to thread this cap back on. And thread that over. And we've got a completed connector again. And we can take that cap back off if we needed to, unthread it. And we can see that those solder joints are still intact. The positive and negative can't really touch because we cut one wire shorter than the other one. That's one of my tips. We're going to thread it back on again. Done. Next thing we're going to go over is how do you join two wires together using solder and uh, and you just need to make a wire longer. This wire that we're looking at here is a is a uh, 12 gauge red stranded wire. And I want to say join two of those wires together or do some kind of a splice. So what I'm going to do is strip the wire and this is called an X splice. And so I've stripped the wire now. And I've got two wires. And 
I'm going to use the helping hand to help me with this. I'm going to tape it down again with the painter's tape. Gives it a little more support. I'm going to put one wire in each side of the helping hand. And again, this is called an X splice. And what you do is you kind of put these together like so. And you just kind of mesh them together and then twist them together at the same time. Like that. And then we're going to use the 60 watt iron. That should be enough heat to solder these together. And with this, I don't have to be real careful. I'm just going to apply heat to the wires. I'm going to start in the middle and work my way out. And just apply heat underneath now and let that solder just flow together. Again, we're using a rosin core solder, so we don't have to add any additional flux to this. We could if we wanted to. Might not be a bad idea. We'll just add some flux to the tip and to the wire. It's really easy to do. Add some more solder. As you can see, this copper is dissipating some heat. It's a good thing I've got a 60 watt iron. Um, a lot of cases you might have to go to a gun if it, if you were in a cold garage or something. But this is doing the job. We're going to add a little bit more here. And we're going to call that good. A little bit more in the middle now. Yeah, if you're working in a cold garage, you got to add some more wattage. All right, so that looks like a good strong solder joint now. Now we're going to let that cool down. And we've got to re-insulate that, so I'm going to put a piece of heat shrink over it now. If this was a longer wire, I'd probably put the shrink on first and move it away from the solder joint, but I'm just going to do this for now as a demonstration. And I'm going to slide this, we're going to cut off this edge with some cutters, slide that over. And now we can just use a, uh, a portable lighter to heat that shrink up and re-insulate that wire again. And now we've got an insulated splice. That's called an X splice. Let's talk about the lead-free solders now. This is a lead-free solder, meaning that it doesn't have lead. Lead is what's left over from uh, uranium. Um, lead has been a great thing for solder over the years, but there's a lot of people nervous about lead causing cancers and things like that. So now they're making lead-free solders. Um, a lot of manufacturers have to use lead-free solder because they can't send their product around to the world if it has lead in it. Um, the lead-free solders have come a long ways. They've added a little bit of copper to the lead-free solders lately. 
which has made them work much more efficiently. Lead-free solders do contain a lot of silver, and the silver jacks up the price. They also have flux cores in them. This is a solder paste used for rework that's a lead-free. Um, it's also a no-clean flux. And then this is a pocket pack of lead-free solder. Very common for people that want to stay safe and effectively solder still. Um, this is a, a magnifying lens that you can wear on your head. I know a lot of you guys are older than me, and your eyesight's kind of gone downhill. This has a great lens on the front. You just wear it over your head like a visor. It has a fold-down lens for real uh, deep magnification, and it also has LED lights on it. It has an adjustable strap on the back. That unit runs currently about $19. Um, this is a, a bench unit. I love this because you can put it on a bench and angle it uh, however you'd like for doing small work. And it has a, uh, a fold-down lid to keep the lens in great shape, an on-off switch. It just fits on a bench so nicely. We sell that for about $65. This is a helping hand. Uh, this is used for soldering. Small items, small wires, uh, proto boards. It has a magnifying lens adjustable on it. Can move it all to all different angles. Has alligator clips to hold your items. You can even duct tape or screw down the uh, mount for more secure uh, jobs. That runs about fourteen dollars. This is a, a cleaning ball. It has a bristle pad in the middle. You can wipe your tip clean with that. Very popular for soldering. $8.24 currently. Let's talk about wick. This is a, uh, a five foot length of number four wick. Wick is a treated copper braid treated with a chemical to absorb solder. And we'll go over that. Uh, this is a proto board that has pre-drilled holes. And it has copper pad on one side only on this one. Um, these are great for building small projects. You can bust the uh, you can bust these eyelet holes together using solder, and make your own uh, make your own traces. In essence, this is a proto board that's made for IC chips, so you can branch off to the items that you need to from the IC. This is a breakaway two-piece section. These are solder aid kits. Um, they're great for adjusting things around as you're soldering with your other hand to hold things in place. Uh, this comes with a, an aluminum heat sink that can be clipped onto things so you can keep them cool while you're soldering them in. Uh, it has a wire brush, it has blades, a fork tip, and a couple of um, sharp tips. And made of steel, the solder will not stick to those as you're using them. Tweezer sets are great for holding very small items while soldering. This is a tweezer set that we sell a lot of. Great for surface mount. And then here's the heat sink again. Great for uh, soldering things that you don't want to get real hot while you're soldering them. And then you undo it later. Next, let's talk about uh, cordless soldering irons. This is a butane iron, also made by Weller. This unit runs currently $144. And it comes with all these items attached inside, and it has a carry case, and so you can put it in a toolbox. And what you do with this unit is you look at the bottom, and it has this little orifice where you can uh, inject the butane. And you put that up firmly, 
against the nozzle of the butane refill and you just press against that and the uh, butane then goes into the chamber and you can see there's a kind of a clear plastic bubble that you can see through and you can see if there's uh, any butane inside there. Um, this is a heat shrink curl attachment that can be put on to this butane iron. It also comes with uh, hot air tips, um, heat shrink torch, and this is a cutting blade for things like plastic. And this is also adjustable heat by turning this this knob at the bottom. That's the low end and that's the high end. Next let's talk about the gun a little bit more. Now this gun <clears throat> is a 260 watt maximum dual heat also. So each time you click the trigger, it changes the heat setting. This unit runs currently at $89. This is, this is a big gun, packs a big punch. And you can see the tip is kind of big. Um, basically, this would be used for heavy wire, um, <clears throat> maybe desoldering big copper uh, plated boards, things of that nature. A few comments from the uh, gallery here. Uh, Dave Sauce was lucky enough to get a Metcal for 35 bucks when I Omega went out of business. That's a heck of a deal. That's uh, jealousy that would inducing. Be wonderful. <laughs> yes. Uh, although, although you do have to repent when buying the tips, if unless you get them for really low cost too. But I've never actually used the Metcal. I believe Chuck Johnson got one here. But it's one of those, you put it in the holster, it's cold, and you pull it out, and by the time you get it to wherever you're going to work, it's up to temperature, as I believe it's about that fast. So, um, but they hold their temperature extremely well. I I bought my old old solder station from Railco many, many years ago, and it's it's uh, worn out a watt or two, and but it's still uh, kicking along, nothing fancy. Let's see, I do have a comment here. Um, yeah, well, first of all, I'll flip, I'll flip the videos back to normal <laughs> in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the edited version, but uh, so people were trying to figure out what language that was in. That's, in, that's in backwards. But one of the most useful things I have here is one of those old tip tinners in the tin, you know, the things I have stuck to it. I think I bought one of those from Rayoko, like, 15 years ago and it's I've used about a third of it up so they don't wear out quickly you know just a little that you know has a little foam solder in it with a lot of flux let's see here um let's see anybody else have any comments about soldering horror stories but uh, that was fairly inclusive on the sorts of things that hams are likely to do although I will I will admit that wars have been fought over the proper way to solder and attach a PL259 connector. <laughs> so, yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot of different ways and I, I've soldered them, but it takes a really hot iron and, and prep work, but, you know, which, but, but I put them out in the middle of, uh, I put them out where the weather can possibly, you know, outside, you know, even though I vapor wrapped them, but uh, I've also, um, if they're compressed tight enough, I, I've seen that happen and haven't had too much trouble. So when you put the um, ferrule in or the adapter in and squish all the braid together. But anyway. Question? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, it's Morris. Uh, I'm interested in uh, your opinion of uh, the traditional versus crimp connectors. Who? Robert. Oh, okay. So a crimp connector, I feel, is a better way to go. And the reason that could be 
is because whenever you solder a wire, if it was stranded, by soldering it, you now make it a solid wire. And in doing so, you take away that flexibility just a little bit more. And I've heard that they don't really uh, allow people to solder wires on airplanes. That's right. I mean, NASA because, doesn't... Because of the vibration of the, the solder joint could be oh, destroyed. Oh, yeah, the, it work hardens like mad, in fact. Yeah. And so the strand, keeping it stranded can really help the connection. Um, in a vibration crimp, environment. Yeah. crimped properly, uh, crimping, I agree, is probably the better way to go. But, but, but do not even think of crimping something unless you have the right tools, if it's important. Right. Yeah. yeah and you, they're not free. No, no. If if you don't have if you don't have the right tools to crimp the connector, solder it instead because I've I've seen plenty of things that were crimped with, you know, badly that 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 are gonna burn up on you. In fact, well, there was an air conditioner um company a few years ago, uh um Goodman had to do a massive recall on air conditioners because one of their contractors that made harnesses used the wrong crimping tool and they caught fire like mad. So they had to go around at great expense and replace all these harnesses and these already installed air conditioning wow. units. Yes. Yeah, so on, on vehicles and airplanes and boats, you, you're probably better off crimping the pin or, or you know, if, if you got the proper tool, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. All right. Anyone else have a question for it? I'd say, I guess, Ratchet Man. <laughs> oh, a... no. Not Ratchet Man. No, Ratchet Man. I always forget to tend the wires. Thanks. Thanks for the video. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's you can't overestimate, underest, uh, overestimate how important it is to tin anything. Yeah, the yeah, I guess my understanding is that the flux, which is literally tree sap in traditional cases, is it actually is a mild acid that that uh, that uh, that mechanical chemically cleans the surface so to remove the oxide layer it's just like flux when you're making uh, or melting metal or steel or something and about to cast it but if it doesn't have flux in it it ain't gonna stick that's the rule of thumb right now um I know in this oh, country. Don't use acid flux for electronics. Yeah, I, I mean, if, if it if it if it whiffs past your face and you're about ready to gag, I don't recommend breathing it. Then you might have the wrong kind of flux. But if it's or if it's used for plumbing or something like that, um, although I I think they've done better at it. I remember using some water soluble flux years ago that you could not leave it on there because it turned out to be conductive. Uh, oh. you know, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't not like the, no, a lot of rosin flux, if you don't care about the way it looked, then you can oh, practically leave it on there because the flux isn't going to conductive and it doesn't absorb water. But some of the uh, original, like 20 years ago now, uh, um, organic fluxes, the water soluble ones, you didn't dare do that because if you put an ohmmeter across it, they were slightly conductive. And if, and I remember people building stuff with that, and then it didn't work, or it just corroded all the wire, all the contacts because it uh, electrolyzed them all. But anyway, uh, let's see here. I think that's mostly it. Oh, let's see. Do you use a fume extractor personally? I do uh, use a fan. Yeah, I, I blow it away with a fan too. I mean, people, I don't, I have not seen credible evidence that lead comes up with the solder fumes, the flux fumes. It's flux fumes. I mean, lead is, a, is rather heavy and it doesn't come up, but, but it is irritating. I mean, if you get it on your skin, but, or something like that is a mild acid, but it is, for most people, it's, it, you know, it doesn't bother you, but if you're soldering all day and have and are inhaling a lot of smoke, you could probably end up with a bit of bronchitis or a so throat or something. So, I, I but I just like you, I just blow it away. 
Yeah. Yeah. Depends on how long I'm going to be soldering. If, uh, if I'm going to be soldering for a little while, I'll, I'll turn a small fan on and just kind of blow the fumes away. I don't use an, ex- I don't use an extraction device. They, you can get those, but I don't feel it's really worth it to me. You have to put the extraction device practically on top of the work because a fan fan can blow from three feet away, but if you're having something that sucks, it has to be right next to it. And it has to make right. a lot of noise or else it's not doing its job. Right. So anyway, um, one of the other things that you didn't mention, um, let's see if I have them here. Uh, and everybody needs them, especially now, are geezer goggles. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so you have them built in, but uh, uh, you're, you're wearing them right now. But yes, uh, and uh, I find when doing surface mount work, it's really not the tininess of the of the components themselves. It's being able to see them clearly. So as long as you put us on some geyser goggles and uh, can see what you're doing. I, Those I, are great. Yeah, these are just, I think these are just Harbor Freight ones, actually. But Uh-huh. The, um, they work pretty well. Yeah, they work fine. And they protect your eyes, too, in case something flips up. So anyway, but but uh, I think people shouldn't be too afraid of soldering tiny things like larger surface mount stuff. It's, it's nothing to be scared of if you have just half-decent tools. But anyway, um, let's see. Richard Scola said, a great refresher course that I really needed. Thanks. Robert from KD7 and KW. So I think you have at All least right. one fan. Okay. Appreciate it, Robert. Uh, where are you now? Are you are you at the at, at, at standard supply or? I am. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just decided to stay here and and uh, do the video instead of go home right yet. Okay. Well, we appreciate you hanging around. So we'll let you go and. Oh, Chuck says, love my Metcal, got it used. Yeah, but lucky. I saw that. He got it for 25 bucks. Uh, or something. Like, I, I, that was a different guy, but yeah, he got it for pretty cheap. I think he got wow. his on Evil Bay for, but yes, I've heard people will pry. Let's well, see, you can have my Metcal and you pry it out of my cold dead fingers. Although I have to, <laughs> although I have to wonder why you'd be holding on to soldering iron anyway. <laughs> Unless it's cold, perhaps. Anyway, Robert, thank you very much for uh, being here tonight and staying over and putting your uh, pretty concise video together. So, All right. Thank you, everyone. All right. Visit. Uh, I, and also, Mike, uh, you have that uh, screen you can put up uh, with uh, his contact information. Uh, we're not we're not you... advertising here, but we do like supporting our local business. Yeah. You know. I see. I see. I see. Um, Let's go so, here, right here, to um, that is uh, the screen. Oh, there it is. All right, there we go. So, if you want to talk to this guy, um, go to ki. You can talk to ki seven fuj himself. You know, I still think you missed the perfect call by one. Let, I'll let you think <laughs> about that for a second. One letter. <laughs> yep. All right. See you later. Thanks. All right. Thank you. And. Uh, uh morris remind people again when we start the classes classes start next week uh technician classes on monday evenings for nine continuous weeks from seven to nine on zoom and general classes on wednesdays from seven to nine for nine weeks on again on zoom all right and 87sr at arrl.net Alpha Delta 7 Sierra Romeo at ARRL.net. Okay. All right. With that, unless somebody has other business, I think we'll call it an evening. Thank you, everyone, for attending virtually. And we hope to see you, if conditions permit, in September when we start doing live and in person meetings. My understanding they'll be up at the U again. But keep tuned. We'll let you know where they will be and when. Seven through everyone, take care. Oh, uh, Ron Jones says, thanks, Robert, and keep picking up, picking the banjo. So.
Anyway, 7-3, everyone.